Hi, my name is Dr. Michael Trax, and I'm a nephrologist in Rockland County, New York. I am not an infectious diseases specialist, but as a physician caring for many immunosuppressed patients, I have been following the coronavirus developments since they came to our attention in early January of this year. I have witnessed a degree of misinformation among our staff and patients and decided to produce this short video to address it. I have gathered available data and advice from the CDC, WHO and other authorities in one place and I hope this will be useful to my patients, my colleagues and beyond. On December 30th, 2019, three bronchioalveolar lavage samples were collected from a patient with pneumonia of unknown etiology in a hospital in Wuhan, central China. There have been cases of unexplained viral pneumonia in Wuhan since early December, and by the end of the month-long spread, the Chinese authorities decided to test in depth. The virus turned out to be a new form of coronavirus, a family of viruses that cause common cold. We are all exposed to mild coronaviruses every winter, but the virus can change and cause more serious disease. Twice in history already, we have seen dangerous coronaviruses emerge, SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012. Genetic studies show this year's virus to be different from SARS, and in fact, WHO gave it a new name, COVID-19. As a result of the testing, the first cases of this novel COVID-19 were officially diagnosed on January 1, 2020, and rapidly grew in number from there. By January 25th, there were 4,000 cases reported a day, but it is important to know that some of these numbers were due to backlog. Around February 1, they decided to deal with the backlog and had one massive day, where they used CT scans rather than slower blood tests to catch up. This explains this peak here. The Chinese might have been slow to recognize the outbreak, but once they did, they acted with conviction. Due to the transmission characteristic we'll talk about later, it became imperative to disrupt community transmission within China, and so they took to the most drastic quarantine measures in modern history. A 12 million metropolis of Wuhan was completely cut off from the rest of the country on January 23rd, and within Wuhan, all social interaction came to a halt. People were told to stay at home, and only one person per household was allowed to buy food every other day. Famously, two new hospitals were built from scratch in a matter of two weeks to house those six with the disease. As you can see, these measures started to work, and in fact, by now, the cases in Wuhan are less of a tenth of what they were a month ago. By February 21, the cases in China started to decrease, and a hope of containment pervaded the news. On the morning of February 22nd, however, things have changed. It was a Saturday morning, and I woke up to the news that large number of new cases were reported in South Korea, Iran, and Northern Italy. This was a game changer. There was reasonable hope that we could stop the virus by halting contact with China or even South Korea, but once Iran and Italy were infected, the spread would have to grow. This changed reality was promptly recognized by the markets, who dropped over a thousand points on Monday morning, and by WHO, which soon changed the risk of the pandemic from high to very high. By end of the week, first US cases without travel links were identified in California and Washington state, effectively stating that local community transmission is taking place, at least on the West Coast. WHO chief said something interesting last week, that although we are not in the midst of a pandemic yet, we are certainly in the midst of the infodemic. Evening news is blasting us with concerning headlines, every new case elevated to breaking news status. Conflicting messages of exaggerated fear on one hand and complacency and minimalization on the other leave us confused. Social media is rife with conspiracy stories as well as home remedies that take us back to eating onions to stave off the plague. Given all this chaos, it is important to start with reliable, up-to-date information which will at least put you ahead of the evening news cycle. Since the beginning of the outbreak, several sources have become the go-tos for those tracking this thing. One of those most useful for the big picture look at the pandemic is the COVID-19 Global Cases Dashboard produced by Johns Hopkins University. 
The dashboard has up-to-date graphical representation of the outbreak and gives us total confirmed daily disease, death and total recovery counts. A very useful tool and it even has a nifty mobile version if you need it. For those who crave more statistical detail, I recommend two other good sources. Worldometers.info is a great site that usually counts world population but has now established an excellent coronavirus site. They prepare an up-to-date table with all cases, new cases, etc., which gives a clear view of the current trends. It is good to see cases in green where the virus appeared but was eradicated. Another such granular site is BNO News, which aggregates news reports from the entire world to report new cases in real time. I also like BNO for reporting the number of critical and seriously ill cases, which foreshadow the death reports. Those sources are good, especially for the real-time reporting, but the most useful and reliable source of COVID-19 information can be found at WHO Situation Reports website. These reports are released daily and provide both an in-depth disease progression statistics and the most recent WHO recommendations. The reports also serve as a clearinghouse for new or updated WHO guidelines for both clinicians and public health officials, so you are reading what they are reading. It is a fantastic site. Finally, for America, the CDC also has a good site, and once the disease starts spreading here more, it will be more important than ever to visit it as well. Here is a current map of infected regions. Again, the map is misleading because not all parts of these countries are infected, but you get the picture. We'll talk about how the virus spreads in a minute, but suffice to say that it spreads with some ease. Again, here's the graph of the cases in Wuhan. The count starts on January 1, which is misleading since the disease was there already before, flying under the radar. But we can assume that once the disease gains a foothold, it grows pretty fast as it is now happening in Italy, Iran, and South Korea. Italy had no cases on January 30th. It has over 1,600 cases today and counting. So it seems that both in China and other countries, it takes about three weeks to go from a few isolated reports to a full-blown community transmission, with the numbers representing only the tip of an iceberg as the mild cases don't even go to a doctor. That puts the West Coast at the Italian numbers by March 20th, and the East Coast probably sometime after that. That is just a guess, but a reasonable one, I think. Here's the good part. Not that bad for most people. Here's the most useful graphic of the virus I've found so far. As you can see, for those below 50 years old, the risk of dying from this disease is tiny. Thankfully, children seem to be spared, which is a huge relief, of course. The main risk, then, is in the elderly and those who have other illnesses. Here is the chart listing which chronic conditions increase the risk, with congestive heart failure and diabetes leading the pack. And here is a reminder that it is not easy to be a man. It seems that the overall mortality of the virus was 17.3% in the first days of the outbreak, from January 1 through January 10, and it went down to 0.7% after February 1st. There could be several reasons for this, but the learning curve of the healthcare system to take care of these cases and to marshal enough resources to do that was likely playing a role. This is shown in the Lancet article which compares the cases from Hubei province where Wuhan is and compares it to other provinces which were not that overwhelmed. Hopefully, with all this lead time, we will be more prepared and keep the death rate lower even among the older and the sick. The calming, or is it overcalming, voices in the media and government are correct in one sense. This here is no Ebola or the plague. It is mostly a minor virus that will give you a sore throat for a few days. But there are vulnerable populations out there and we have to do our best to protect them. This is an interesting graph showing how contagious this coronavirus is. It is slightly worse than the flu, but much better than measles. Currently, WHO feels one patient can infect between two to three other people, which can mean an explosive, uncontrolled growth or reasonable containment, depending on what we do. For respiratory viruses, there are two forms of possible spread, airborne and droplet. 
Airborne spread happens when germs flow through the air after a person talks, coughs, or sneezes. Those germs can be inhaled even after the original person is no longer nearby. Germs like chickenpox and TB are spread through the air, but as far as we know now, the COVID-19 virus does not seem to spread that way. Droplet spread happens when fluids in large droplets from a coughing sick person somehow make their way to the nose, eyes, or mouth of another person. These could also travel through a cut in the skin, but will not penetrate intact skin. Droplets may cause short-term environmental contamination in the air around the person, but they tend to fall to the ground or other surfaces. The problem is that once they fall on these surfaces, they could survive on them for some time. We do not know how long COVID-19 survives, so the main route of transmission of the virus, according to WHO, is this. A sick patient coughs, spreading the droplets within six feet around them. These droplets can be directly inhaled by those within the six feet of a sick patient, that a special respiratory mask called the N95 is needed by the healthcare workers who work with such patients. More on the masks later. Though this fact is concerning, it also means that staying more than six feet from an infected individual will be largely protected from spread. After a short time, the exact duration of which is not known yet, the droplets fall from the air and land on surfaces, such as tables, everyday objects, etc. If a healthy person then touches the contaminated object, the virus transmits to the skin. It cannot infect through the skin, but since we touch our faces constantly, sooner or later the virus ends up on the mucous membrane of an eye, nose or mouth from where it enters the body. Thus, to make it clear, WHO thinks COVID-19 is spreading through respiratory droplet route, not the airborne route. It should not spread through entire buildings or even large rooms, so keeping distance from someone who's coughing will usually be enough to protect you. It also means that as general population, we have gotten the prevention bit here all wrong so far. Why? Because you cannot buy a mask anywhere, but the sanitizing wipes are there for the taking. Look, I'm a doctor, and until I really sit down and read the WHO report, I did not perceive the things correctly here. Have been hearing about hand washing on TV all the time, of course, but took it as a piece of general advice issued in the absence of real prevention strategy. Meanwhile, it is the prevention strategy. By far, the most likely way to get sick is to touch the contaminated surface and then touch your face. Rather than about the mask then, it is all about frequent hand washing and strategies to avoid touching objects in public. I will leave this to your own imagination, but using sterile wipes to turn doorknobs or perhaps even wearing gloves in public might be the best way to go. The only issue with using such hand barriers is that you have to be exceedingly careful of how you dispose of them. In fact, CDC has special instructions on how to remove contaminated gloves in order to not to get infected, and I listed these in the comments below. There are no official recommendations on what to do here beyond frequent hand washing, so the best piece of advice is this. Understand the surface spread of the virus, wash your hands properly, including thumbs, areas between fingers and wrists, and do not touch your face. But of course, it is hard not to talk about masks and the fact that respiratory droplets do stay in the air in the immediate vicinity of the infected person. First, let us talk about the two types of masks out there and then decide if they are indeed useful. The most common mask out there is a simple barrier mask. The regular masks do serve an important role, but not for the healthy. They are there for the coughing sick, who can then limit spread of the respiratory droplets around them. One of the most sensible strategies in the coming days will be to insist that anyone who's coughing should be wearing a mask in public. These masks are not nearly tight enough to prevent inhalation of the droplets by a healthy person, so they are really not useful for prevention and the health agencies do not recommend them. Knowing life, most people will wear them to feel safer and that's okay. Just do not spend an inordinate amount of money on them. The masks that do keep the virus out are called N95 respirators. They keep 95% of respiratory droplets from entering your body, so are not 100% proof, but they are standard of care for the doctors and nurses who care for these patients. N95s are a bit tricky to size and put on, and unless you get the right seal, they are not as useful either. Hospitals make us all get fitted for them once a year, so if you do decide to wear one, make sure you follow the fitting instructions carefully. At the current time, 
There are no recommendations to wear N95 masks in public, and they should be reserved for the hospital staff caring for the sick. I believe the only reason we are talking about COVID-19 today is its asymptomatic transmission. This means that after entering the body, the virus replicates and can spread to other people without causing any symptoms in the host. The time it takes the virus to cause disease is called an incubation period. The flu's incubation period is one through four days, so a flu-infected patient gets sick quick and stays home to recuperate. A COVID-19 patient can walk around for an average of about seven days, shedding the virus to the others, but not knowing that they have it. That is why the extent of this virus is so widespread. We are isolating the sick patients, but with no rapid tests available, have no clue which healthy ones have it. How do we protect against invisible menace then? Back to washing hands and not touching your face. For now, that is all we got. Again, the good news is that about 80% of COVID-19 cases are mild. Here is what the symptoms are. Fever in 88% of people, dry cough in 67%. Note that nasal congestion, meaning a stuffy nose, is only present in about 5% of cases. This means that if somebody is sneezing next to you and clearly has a stuffy nose, they are likely not infected with COVID, but just have a common cold. As of March 1, we have one promising treatment already undergoing clinical trials and at least one vaccine which is getting ready for testing as well. The vaccine will not be ready until at least a year from now, so that is less relevant. The antiviral treatment, however, is probably how we are going to mitigate this outbreak. The drug is called remdesivir and it is a broad-spectrum antiviral treatment that was developed for Ebola, but which has also worked against other coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS. One of the first American patients was a young man in his 30s who became quite sick with the virus and was given remdesivir on an experimental basis. He quickly recovered, so the hope is that the drug will work in other patients as well. For now, just go along with our lives, though some prudent measures could be taken. Masks are already gone. But, as you have learned, they are not that useful anyway. Do buy some single-use Clorox wipes to handle outside surfaces once the virus hits. Do take hand washing seriously and see if you can train yourself to stop touching your face all the time. And be at least somewhat ready for possible quarantines. I doubt the Western societies will impose the draconian can't-leave-your-house-for-a-month measures we've seen in China, but it will become advisable to avoid crowded places such as supermarkets, so having some extra food stashed away may not be a bad idea. I think that more critical items such as prescription medicines, sanitary pads, diapers and baby food should be stocked as well. There is a very little fine line between prudence and panic and it is up to all of us to tread the line carefully. In all likelihood, and for most of us, things will turn up just fine. Aside from a minority of the patients with more advanced illnesses, most of us will likely get to stay home, watch some Netflix and stream video games, as the people in China did. As healthcare providers, we will have to be extra careful in our jobs and, once the virus comes to our area, I do recommend self-isolating at home if you are older or have the conditions we've talked about before. But, in the end, this too shall pass. We may even experience a brief moment of unity and introspection as a result of all this, but we'll likely go back to our usual ways before we know it.